Right then guys, here we are for my first and potentially only video on the Grand Tour game. In this video, I'll go through what I found out after testing the speed of every car in the game. So I've driven a lap around the Ebola Drome in every car to create my own power lap board. I've also timed how long it takes every vehicle to get from 0 to 60 and 0 to 100 miles an hour to find out what the quickest and slowest vehicles are in the game. I should point out that this video has been recorded just after Series 3 finished, so only includes the cars from all of Series 3 as well as the first episode of Series 1 and 2. This is why I said it might be the only video because if they don't add any more episodes into the game then this will be it. However, if they do add more episodes and thus more cars later on, then I will make a video showing how well they do around the Ebola drone. You may think comparing the speed of each car in this game is pointless, and I guess to a large extent it is. Given that the driving physics in this game are rubbish, I'm struggling to think of many games with more poorly implemented steering systems. Almost every car in the game has this weird input delay slash wind up to the steering that takes a very long time to get used to, and the fact I can't even tell whether it's an input delay or a wind up shows just how weird the steering is. But then again, this is from the same developers who programmed the strangest off-road driving physics. I was going to talk about it in this video, but I would need an extra 3 minutes just to go through all of the off-road specific issues. The most easily demonstrable one is, well look at how difficult it is to keep the Lotus Type 25 in a straight line. That's due to the game randomly steering the car itself in a vain attempt to simulate a lack of traction. Yeah sure you shouldn't be driving the Lotus Type 25 off road, and if you did it wouldn't do very well, but it wouldn't behave like this. This isn't a lack of traction, it's the steering having a mind of its own, that's not what off road driving is. But on the off road dune buggy course the same car does just fine. If you want to know the rest, then pause the video now to read this cutout part of the script, because I don't want to devote that much time to talking about a frankly completely illogical and minor part of the game. So on to the experience of doing a lap of the Ebola Drome with every single vehicle. To keep the laps fair and comparable, I try to not take four wheels off the track with any car, and I made a strict rule on not hitting any walls, most notably the wall that divides the two halves of the isn't. I probably should explain how I timed my laps, given that there isn't a race timer in the split screen mode. So what I did was get the footage of each lap and use Sony Vegas to find out how long each lap is. So I split the recording on the first frame where the game says go, and then on the first frame where the game says lap 2. I also used the same method to time the acceleration runs with each car going from 0 to 60 and 0 to 100 miles per hour. And trust me, some of those acceleration runs revealed some baffling results. Well let's stay in Algarve because the slowest car to lap the Ebola drone was also the slowest to go from 0 to 60. The Volkswagen Amarok took 7.6 seconds to get from stationary to 60 miles an hour, which is around the same time it takes to get the quickest Amarok models to do it in the real world. So I guess it's realistic in that sense, but it's also tangibly slower accelerating than the Mercedes X-Class and the Ford Ranger. The Ford is the quickest from 0 to 60 in the game, but in real life, it's 0 to 60 time is over 10 seconds, whereas the Mercedes and VWs are just over 7 seconds, but the VW is slightly quicker. So not only is the 0 to 60 time a way off for the Ford Ranger, but the three pickups are in reverse order performance wise to where they are in real life. The Amarok is also the only car to get from 0 to 100 miles an hour in over 20 seconds. Even though again it should be the quickest of the pickups, not the slowest. 
Around a full lap of the Ebola drone, the Amarok was the slowest by a landslide. It did a 1 minute 15.5 second lap. Which sounds impressive in context to the show as that lap would be the joint third quickest one ever had it happened in the real world. That's right, the scaling in the game is so far off that the slowest car in this game is comparable to an Aston Martin Vulcan's real world performance. The hilarious thing is that the next slowest car, the Mercedes X-Class, did a 1 minute 12.1, which is a full 8 tenths quicker than the McLaren Senna went around the track in real life. The Ford Ranger Wild Track was another half a second quicker, which makes sense, given that it's the quickest of the three in the game, even if it's the slowest one in reality. I've spent so much time talking about the pickups when the bigger logical issue hasn't even been touched upon until now. The presenters RVs were all considerably quicker than the brand new production pickups. Why? Well, I can't answer that, but I do know how they were faster. Simply put, it comes down to power and acceleration. I know I haven't talked about the handling of each of the cars much, but the driving physics are so basic and numb that there aren't many nuances to talk about. Although Jeremy Clarkson's RV is unique, as it has a slight wobble that no other vehicle has. Once you stop steering it just sways to one side and very slightly alters your heading. I don't know how well it comes across in the video, but in the game you can definitely feel it with this and only this RV. I assume it's either due to how tall it is or it's a reference to the fact Jeremy's RV collapsed on one side during their road trip. Either way, the handling didn't impact the RV too much around the Ebola drone because it was 1.4 seconds quicker than the quickest pickup, and even 8 times quicker than May's RV. As I mentioned earlier, it all comes down to the straight line speed performance of the RVs. Let's not forget the 0-60 times of all three of the pickups was just over 7 seconds. With May's RV, it was 6.1 seconds, and Clarkson's RV did it in 5.5 seconds. I would question why Jeremy's was quicker, but I guess May's did have to carry an entire pub. But Clarkson's RV should not be quicker than the pickups. It's almost like the developers programmed the free pickups, and then when they came to program the RVs, they didn't program them in reference to the pickups. You can almost feel when each vehicle was programmed into the game because there's a few logical performance issues. The performance of one RV compared to another is fine, but compare it to another vehicle from another episode and it doesn't really make sense. I know I've been moving up through the lap time leaderboard slowly, but I needed to establish some benchmark times to give context to these particularly strange early results. So the next car to mention is John. The flat pack three seater Land Rover-esque car from the Mongolian trip was quicker than May's RV, but slower than Clarkson's. It's much slower accelerating than the RVs, so gained lap time purely through nimbleness and a lack of size. The next quickest car is really more like a motorised trike, as it's the Fuller A7. Yep, that's in the game and it's expectedly slow and doesn't really drift, although it only has three wheels so I can understand why. Around the Ebola drone, it was 1.4 seconds quicker than Jeremy's RV, and was the first vehicle to do a sub 1 minute 10 lap. The next two cars are also associated with Richard. First is his lifted Chevy Silverado from the Columbia Special, which was 7 times quicker than the Fulu. And a further 8 times quicker is his environmentally friendly Land Rover. Rounding off the bottom end of the power lap board is James May's Fiat Panda from the Columbia trip, Richard Hammond's RV was next and is surprisingly quick, especially as it was less than 3 tenths of a second off of Jeremy Clarkson's Alpha GT V6. Finally, there's the 1962 Chevrolet Corvette and Richard's Fiat X19 without the roof. The fact it didn't have a roof is important because some cars have two versions. 
sometimes the two different versions are just aesthetically different, but sometimes they have different performance stats. Any car which is just a repaint or a slightly different looking version of another car, I didn't bother with. But the X19 is an example of a car with two different versions that are different to drive. They didn't feel massively different, but the game says the one without a roof has better handling, whilst the one with a roof has a greater top speed. Don't ask me why, I don't understand it either. All I do know is that the acceleration is meant to be basically the same, but it wasn't. The one with a roof was slower around the Ebola drone, and given that it got from 0 to 60 in 6.5 seconds versus 5.4 seconds for the exact same car but without a roof, that's hardly surprising. The one without a roof was also quicker to 100 miles an hour by one second, despite it supposedly being the one with the better handling, not acceleration or top speed. Oh, and by the way, on the top speed front, both cars maxed out at 140 miles per hour. Much like with the acceleration times, there was just over one second separating the lap times of the two X19s. I certainly didn't notice any difference in the handling of the two cars, despite what the game said, and anyway, if there was a major handling difference, there would be an even bigger gap between the two cars, despite the fact they are, in essence, exactly the same. In between the two X19s, in ascending order, is the Lancia Gamma Coupe, and then James May's Larder Reaver Firetruck. I'm just as surprised as you are that an old larder carrying hoses, water and piping is quicker than a Fiat X19, a Lancia Gamma and even 1.3 seconds quicker than both an Alfa Romeo GTV6 and the 1962 Chevy Corvette. To be fair, this is a very tightly packed part of the lap board because 5.8 seconds separates every single car from May's Fiat Panda all the way up to the standard version of the Citroen C3 Aircross. Sounds uninteresting, but that's 29 cars separated by only 5.8 seconds. Rather oddly, the next quickest car after the ruthless Fiat X19 was the battered old Renault 9 Abbey Eaton drove in Azerbaijan. After that is the Lotus Cortina Rally, which is quicker than the Renault by 1.1 seconds. Quicker by 33 thousandths of a second or a single frame is Neil Armstrong's 1967 Chevrolet Corvette. The 67 Corvette is nearly 9 tenths of a second quicker to 60 miles an hour than the 62 Corvette, and 3.2 seconds quicker to 100 miles an hour. The only way the 62 Corvette made up time was through taking the corners on the isn't totally flat out, whilst the 67 understeered so badly that I needed to use the drift button to get around the corners whilst losing as little time as possible. I'll get back to the drifting function later on, as it's a really interesting part of the driving physics. Jeremy's V8 powered Beetle Beach Buggy was the first car in the 1 minute freeze, with 8 other cars in that time frame, including all of the Fords featured in the final episode of Series 3, with the exception of the Lotus Cortina Rally which was in the 1 minute fours. So everything from the Mark II Cortina to the Sierra Cosworth to the Mondeo Estate were almost exactly as quick as each other. That shouldn't really be the case, but the biggest crime of all was that the quickest classic Ford was the Mark III Cortina. The second quickest was the Mark II Cortina. There's so many logical problems with that, such as the fact the Sierra should probably be the quickest, or if not, then the Mondeo, and the two Ford Cortinas were quicker than both Lotus Cortinas. To be fair, the track going Lotus Cortina is the quickest of the bunch to 60 and 100 miles per hour, so I can only really put down its slower lap due to me not fully exploiting its potential. You may also think I bottled the Sierra's and Mondeo's laps, but I honestly didn't. The next quickest car from 0 to 60 was the Mark II Cortina, with a time of 4.6 seconds. Then it's the Mondeo in 4.7 seconds, then the Mark III Cortina in 4.8, and finally the Sierra Cosworth was the slowest, getting there after 5 seconds. 
even going up to 100 miles an hour, the order doesn't change, even if the time gaps do. The Sierra is the slowest accelerating classic Ford, even including the Rally Cortina. So in actual fact, the Sierra beating the Mondeo around the Ebola Drome, albeit by less than two tenths of a second, is a miracle. Next up after the Mark II Cortina is the BMW M2, then the Lotus Type 25 which finished behind the Bentley Bentayga, and surprisingly all three of those cars finished behind Jeremy's second-hand Jeep Wrangler. Next is the Mercedes S-Class James took to China, the VW Polo GTI, and then the BMW 750iL, which Jeremy took to China. The next car is the French police version of the Citroen C3 Aircross. So this is another case of having two slightly different versions of the same car, except they're not different. Visually, yes. Performance-wise, no. The police version is meant to be quicker accelerating, and okay, yeah sure it was. It was 33 thousandths of a second, or one frame, quicker to both 60 and 100 miles an hour than the normal car. In reality, they're the same car. And the 3 tenth lap difference between the police car and the normal one is down purely to me and nothing else. Even with the small gap between the C3s, the Ford Fiesta and Renault Alpine still split them. We're now at a key turning point in the list, because every car from here on out couldn't go flat out around the isn't without smacking into the wall. The S-Class is the seminal point, and every car quicker than it even needed to drift or lift off going around the second kink in the isn't. A few of the slower cars did as well, such as the Lotus Cortina or the long and heavy Chevrolet Corvettes. Even the Polo and Fiesta, which don't really drift compared to most of the other vehicles, needed a dab of drift to make it around the turn. You'll notice though that the brake lights flashed on when I pressed square to drift, and that's because the drift button is a sort of brake. Logically, you'd assume the brake button controls the disc brakes, and the drift button controls the handbrake, but I don't think that's quite how it works. Another case of cars from a single group being similar to each other but different to others from a different episode or series or whatever, are the three Mustangs from the show's opening. All of them lock up the rear wheels quite severely under braking which makes them very tricky to drive. That is assuming you decelerate using the drift and brake buttons together, because if you just use L2 to brake, the rear wheels are no problem at all. Regardless, they are so tricky to drive under maximum braking force that they're slower around the Ebola drone than cars which are slower accelerating but easier to drive, such as the Alpina M5 Turbo or even the dune buggy Richard drove in America. I often brake using the brake and drift button at the same time, which works in most cars, but less so in these three Mustangs. The Porsche 917 has the same character trait, except it is easier to control under braking despite the rears locking up. On its actual lap, pressing the brake and drift button, it decelerated, I think, faster than any other car in the game. Afterwards, I did most of a lap in the Porsche using just the drift button, and you can see the rear tyres smoking away, but the car still slowed down enough to get around the corner. I think the brake button controls the front brakes, and the drift button the rear brakes. The thing that makes the Mustangs and the 917 stand out is that they have very powerful front and rear brakes, whereas most cars only have good front brakes. I tried to drive the Mondeo Estate using just the brake button and it slowed down just fine, albeit slower than usual, but trying to use only the drift button in that and most other cars just doesn't work. So back onto the Mustangs, despite their performance potential, the fact that the cars squirrel about under braking means they lost valuable lap time. The Galpin Rocket was still the first car to do a sub 60 second lap, and it did it by a substantial margin. It was 2.2 seconds quicker than the next slowest car, the Citroen C3 Aircross. 
which is hardly a shock given that the rocket was one second quicker to 60 miles an hour than the Citroen. Next is the Shelby GT350R, which went a quarter of a second quicker than the rocket. And then it's the Alpina M5 Turbo, which split the three Mustangs as it was less than half a tenth behind the Roush Stage 3. That's despite the BMW being two tenths slower to 60 than the Mustangs, and nearly two seconds slower to 100 miles an hour. Next is Richard Hammond's Dune Buggy, which took only 58.1 seconds to lap the Ebola drone. More impressively, it took just over 3 seconds to get to 60 miles an hour, which is impressive even in the context of the game. However, its 0 to 100 time was 6.94 seconds, slower than the trio of Mustangs. So its initial acceleration is amazing, but high end acceleration and top speed is less impressive. But given that it's a Dune racer, that's not too surprising. Despite its phenomenal 0-60 time, the Dune Buggy was beaten by the slower accelerating Lamborghini Countach, which is the first car to dip into the 57 second range. Due to the fact I have to time the laps by counting the frames of the recorded video, two cars set identical lap times. Both the Lancia Delta Futurista and the BMW M5 set 57.724 seconds lap times. The BMW is the quicker accelerating car, so this is another case of me driving one car better than the other. I tried my best with both cars, but the rubbish driving physics, especially the input delay on the steering, means it's very difficult to be accurate and consistent when driving. And also, it means I couldn't notice any major differences between the two cars, which would explain why they set exactly the same lap time. The Ferrari Testarossa was exactly two times quicker than the Countach, despite the Countach setting the faster time in real life, and the fact it is the quicker accelerating car of the two in the game. What swung it in the Ferrari's favour is it is much happier to drift than the Countach is. In this game, drifting is key to getting around corners quickly, and a car that doesn't have a large drifting angle will naturally take a wider and longer line around each applicable corner. In short, it's the drifting equivalent of understeer, and since the Countach wouldn't kick its tail out as much, it's lost time compared to the Testarossa. Another two cars that set identical times were the Bensley Continental GT, and as the game calls it, the Honda Honda NSX. I don't know why they list the manufacturer's name twice, but in the ocean of issues and weird quirks in this game, this is just a drop-sized problem. The final five cars that just missed out on being in the top 20 are the Lamborghini Urus, the Dune Buggy Jeremy drove in America, the BMW M850i, the Di Tommaso Pantera GTS, and finally, the Aston Martin V8 Vantage. The slowest cars in the top 20 are setting 55 seconds lap times, and the quickest car did a 47.981, a far cry from the 75.5 second lap the Volkswagen Amarok did. The Lotus Type 38 proved to be the 20th fastest car, and was only two times behind the much more modern, although technically not real, Popmobile. The Popmobile is the workaround for what I can only assume were licensing restrictions. What it's actually meant to be is the Jaguar Project 8, and performance-wise the fact it was quicker than the Vantage proves it's definitely the Project 8 under all the bubble wrap. The next car is the first one to go from 0 to 60 in under 3 seconds, the Lamborghini Aventador. It did it in 2.936 seconds, which is actually pretty accurate to the real lifetime. The first of five cars to finish in the 53 second range is the Lotus Aurora GT430, a car which didn't appear on the show but is in the game as a Twitch Prime bonus. The Dodge Challenger Hellcat is also a Twitch bonus and is the next quickest car, going over a tenth quicker than the Evora, and setting the exact same lap time as the McLaren P1. 
Yep, the P1 is only the 15th fastest car, but it is a lively one. Not so much tricky because most of the cars at this end of the table are tricky to keep within the track limits just by how quick they are. But the P1 has a very light rear end which is helpful to a point. It's the joint 10th fastest car in the game to get from 0 to 60 miles an hour, but the fact it's more of a handful than most lets it down. The June buggy James May fell in love with for some reason is the 7th fastest accelerating car from 0 to 60, the 13th fastest from 0 to 100, and the 14th fastest car around the Ebola drone. I don't know why it's so much quicker than the other June buggies, never mind so fast in general, but it's quicker to 60 than a McLaren P1 and more predictable and controllable to drive, so no wonder it beat the McLaren's lap time. Beating the quickest off-road class car in the game in ascending order is the Aston Martin DBS Superleggera, which is a wonderful car to drive even in this game and probably the nicest one of the lot. And then the next quickest car is the Ford Mustang RTR Spec 3, which is the first of seven cars to complete a lap in the area of 52 seconds. Porsche occupy 11th and 10th places with the Porsche 911 Turbo S just losing out to the 918 Hypercar. The Ferrari 488 GTB went a tenth of a second quicker than the hybrid Porsche 918 and staggeringly is also the third quickest car to get to 60 miles an hour. In 8th place is the previously mentioned Porsche 917 which is the only car in the game to combine brutal stopping power with stability. It also reaches a higher speed than any other car in the game. I didn't test out every car's top speed but I did run 24 cars around the Millbrook Bowl and the Porsche came out with a top speed of 212 miles per hour. That was only after using gravity to get past 206 miles an hour because seemingly the way to get the highest top speed is to ride up on the banking and then once you top out come down the banking and gravity gives you in this case an extra 6 miles an hour. Just as a side note to this, of all the cars I drove around the high speed bowl, the presenter made John has the lowest top speed with only 115 miles an hour. The Dodge Challenger SRT Demon is the 7th fastest car around the Ebola Drome, finishing just behind the McLaren 720S. Yes, the 720S was quicker than the P1. In 5th place is the quickest accelerating car with a 0-60 time of 2.2 seconds in this game, the Ferrari LaFerrari. It set a lap time of 51.3 seconds, 7 tenths ahead of the McLaren 720S, but 3 tenths behind the 1000 horsepower Hennessy Exorcist. The Exorcist also holds the rare accolade of being able to exceed 200 miles an hour. In third place is one of the biggest surprises, for me at least, the Porsche 911 GT2 RS. To be fair, the 911 Turbo was incredibly quick, so the GT2 was going to be quicker. But I didn't expect this sports class car to be the fastest petrol powered car in the game. That's right, in second place is the Remac Concept 1, and it went a full 1.7 seconds quicker than the 911 GT2, with a lap time of 49.2 seconds. The Remac is a strange car to drive as it sort of rotates on an axis rather than steers, and then crabs slightly after you've made it around a corner. It's not a problem, just another weird and car specific performance trait. Actually, combine the rotating-esque steering and the separate buttons for the front and rear brakes and the driving physics would be eerily similar to the safety cars in MotoGP 14. That's a motorbike game, yet has car physics comparable to the official game of the biggest motoring show in the world. And finally, the quickest car in the game and 1.3 seconds quicker than the Rimac is the Neo EP9. It's slightly slower to 60 and 100 than the Rimac due to the fact the Neo has gears and loses time shifting through them, whereas the Rimac never drops off the power even for a millisecond. 
the Remax crabbing meant I took some corners at a much sharper angle, namely your name here. Meaning I had to slow down more and lost speed going around and exiting that corner, if nothing else. The Neo on the other hand steers like most cars do, and possibly due to the aero parts which it has and the Rimac doesn't, meant the Neo was much better through the corners. That just about ends this video with the Neo EP9, the second quickest car to lap the Ebola Drome in real life, as the quickest car in the game. It went an astonishing 27 seconds faster in the game than it did in real life. So on screen you can see the full rundown of the lap times for all 74 of the unique vehicles that are in the game at the time of the recording of this video. There were some very unusual results, but given that this game isn't meant to be that realistic, and was probably made in a rush and on a limited budget, that's not surprising. The dune buggies were the biggest shock, but this game is a wash with irregularities and dubious vehicle performances. Even still, it is nice to know that the show's officially licensed game produced a power lap board which has a number of similarities to the show's own. And with all of that said, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, if you did be sure to leave a like, comment down below, and I'll see you guys in whatever I upload next. So I'll see you guys then.